2018, and the time is 1 o'clock. The location is the Department of Consumer Affairs, Headquarters 2, 1747 North Market Boulevard, Room 186, Sacramento, California, 95834-1924. The board's paramount responsibility is to protect the health, welfare, and safety of the public through licensure, education, and enforcement in chiropractic care. Please be aware that this meeting is being audio and video recorded for live webcast. Please turn off or silence all cell phones. We will now take roll call. Dr. Azalino, would you please call the roll? Dr. Heather Dane. Here. Dr. Sergio Azalino, present. Mr. Frank Rufino. Present. Dr. Dr. Thank you. I'd like to have Mr. Rufino lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Next item on the agenda is the chair's report. We're starting the meeting a little bit later today at 1 o'clock instead of the normal morning start time um, because we completed True Colors training this morning. Uh, it was a great presentation done by Solid. We discovered better ways to communicate, and I hope it leads to better communication and conflict resolution in the future. Our board committees have been working on their respective projects, and I look forward to hearing about the progress of the Enforcement Committee and revisions of the Expert Witness Program. The CE Committee continues to work on new regs and have some items to bring forward to the full board for discussion so we continue to progress forward with these regulations. Um, Dr. Dion McLean, who's not here today, participated in the CCA Women's Panel at their sports symposium in April and all feedback was that she did a fantastic job um, as did Dr. Hewitt organizing the women's panel and it was well received by licensees. And I want to remind board members of upcoming opportunities for participation. The CCA convention is in October in San Diego. The dates are on their website and um, there are also participation opportunities yearly at the National Board of Chiropractic Examiners Part 4 uh, examiners. That is every May and November, and board members are always encouraged to participate. Um, there's also Part 4 Test Selection Committee, which is in June in Greeley, Colorado, at the board, National Board of Chiropractic Examiners headquarters. Um, the Part 4 examiners are twice yearly. The Test Selection Committee is yearly, and if you have interest in participating in those things or in, in CCA convention, please talk to Mr. Puglio about that. I'd like to introduce Patrick Lay from the Department of Consumer Affairs. Thank you for joining us today. Good afternoon. Uh, Chair Dan, uh, Vice Chair Lichtman, Executive Officer Pulero, members of the board. Uh, well, first of all, thank you so much for allowing this opportunity for me to provide an update from the Department of Consumer Affairs uh, to your board. Uh, as mentioned, my name is uh, Patrick Clay. I'm the Assistant Deputy Director for Board and Bureau Services at the Department. Um, uh, I work under uh, Deputy Director Christopher Castrillo, and uh, between him and uh, myself, our responsibilities include supporting uh, your board and the work that you do in any capacity uh, that we can. Um, I've been on the job for a whopping seven months, which I'm told translate into 10 years of department time. Uh, so, Officer Puleo, I'm right behind you in terms of veterancy uh, at the department. Um, a little bit about myself, if I may. Uh, prior to joining the department, I served as the Assistant Chief of External Affairs. I covered California at the State's Health Benefit Exchange, where I helped implement the Affordable Care Act since it opened its doors uh, in 2013. Uh, and prior to that, uh, I worked in the California State Assembly, where I staffed issues uh, related to the judiciary uh, and veterans' affairs. 
Uh, so with that, again, thank you so much for having me, and I will begin uh, my update. Uh, my first one is a personal uh, uh, personnel update. Uh, the department recently welcomed a new deputy director uh, for legislative affairs, Mr. Dennis Cuevas Romero. Uh, we're incredibly excited to have him on board. Uh, before coming to the department, Mr. Cuevas Romero was the government relations director at the American Heart Association uh, since 2016. And prior to that, he was uh, a legislative associate at the Hernandez Strategy Group from 2013 to 2016. Uh, so again, we're incredibly excited to have him on board. And we hope you can join us in welcoming Mr. Dennis Cuevas Romero to the DCA family. Uh, my next update is regarding the director's quarterly meeting. This past uh, April 30th, uh, the department held its second 2018 uh, director's quarterly meeting with board executive officers uh, and bureau chiefs. Uh, as usual, uh, these quarterly meetings are an opportunity to ensure that Director Grafilo uh, is available to you uh, to hear the important issues facing the department uh, and its board and bureaus. Uh, at this last uh, quarterly meeting, we're actually honored uh, to be joined by Secretary Podesta uh, from the Business, Consumer Services, and Housing Agency uh, at the last meeting, where we're able to engage in critical topics important uh, to the department. Uh, but in addition to executive officers and bureau chief, we also want to make sure that our director is available to board members, uh, which is why my next update is regarding a director leadership call. Uh, so this upcoming June 25th, uh, Director Grafilo will be hosting a conference call with board presidents and board vice presidents. Uh, and we're looking forward to your participation and a fruitful conversation about the department uh, and the issues that you care about. Uh, again, the teleconference call with Director Grafilo will take place on June 25th from 1.30 p.m. to 3 p.m. Uh, you should have received an email communication uh, about, uh, with additional details, but feel free to reach out uh, if you need uh, uh, any assistance with RSVP. Uh, my next update is regarding uh, licensing and enforcement work groups. Uh, in April, the department hosted licensing and enforcement work group uh, kickoff meetings uh, with 60 board and bureau staff in attendance. We believe this was a productive first meeting that will help uh, the department establish licensing and enforcement best practices and standards. Uh, the department will continue hosting monthly meetings specifically focused on licensing and specifically focused on enforcement to narrow down on specific recommendations as related to board's various performance measures. Uh, the department has hosted an enforcement work group meeting in May uh, and will host a licensing work group meeting uh, this month. Uh, my next update is regarding DCA leadership training. The department's future leadership development program and its inaugural cohort uh, graduated last March. 12 individuals completed DCA's eight month leadership program participating in uh, special leadership development exercises working on special projects that could positively impact the department. Uh, they developed new working relationships and met with several key executives uh, who shared career advice. Uh, be on the lookout for additional communications from our solid team for information about the next cohort. Uh, my next item is one that you're very familiar with. Uh, solid uh, now offers additional training and team building exercises specifically geared for board members uh, and executive level uh, board and bureau staff. Uh, as you know, these courses are designed to improve cohesiveness within groups, provide a safe environment, and build positive relationships uh, in the workplace. Uh, board members and executives can choose from a customized series from course topics, uh, including, as you know, true colors, conflict styles, going from good to great, leadership styles, and working with difficult people. Uh, my next update is regarding the Substance Abuse Coordination Committee. Uh, this past April, the department reconvened the Substance Abuse Coordination Committee. Uh, per Senate Bill 796, uh, the committee has been tasked with examining uniform standard number four uh, related to drug testing standards for substance abusing uh, licensees in a diversion program or in programs that have adopted uh, the uniform standards. Uh, as you know, uniform standard number four uh, is the guideline related to all aspects of drug testing, including testing frequency, types of tests, disciplinary requirements for testing violations, uh, and more. Uh, the committee will determine if the existing criteria for uniform standard number four needs to, up, do, needs to be updated uh, based on recent uh, advances in uh, testing research uh, and technology, uh, and is also tasked to report back to the legislature by January 1st of 2019. Uh, per statute, the committee is made up of the Healing Arts Board's ex executive officers, a designate from the Department of Healthcare Services, and is chaired by the, uh, the director of the department. 
Uh, at the last meeting, the committee determined to collect more information and expert testimony on various topics, including emerging drug testing technologies uh, and uh, currently contracted uh, vendors uh, by the department. The next Substance Abuse Coordination uh, Committee meeting will take place on Wednesday, June 27th, uh, here in Sacramento, and we'll continue uh, this conversation on updating Uniform Standard Number 4. Uh, and my last update is regarding required board member training. Uh, dates for the 2018 board member orientation training, or BMOT, have been set. We actually have one tomorrow in uh, June 6th. Uh, the next one will be September 18th, uh, and the last one for the year will be December 5th. As you know, this is a one-day training in Sacramento, which details the important functions and responsibilities of board members. Uh, registration is online, uh, and as you know, the training is required within one year of appointment or reappointment to a board. Uh, of course, if you need any help uh, registering, you can contact the SOLID team or any members of the Board and Bureau Services uh, team. So uh, that concludes my update, and as a point of personal privilege, I wanted to say that uh, although I am new to the department, it's been an incredible privilege to have this opportunity uh, to both work with you uh, and with staff and every day learn about the incredible work that you do uh, protecting California consumers and California patients. So again, thank you so much for having me today. Thank you so much for your time. Madam Chair, I got a... Absolutely. You, <clears throat> um, thank you, Patrick, and <clears throat> congratulations on your appointment. Thank you. Just to be clear, I got just a quick question regarding your presentation. The first one deals with the uh, DCA leadership program. Uh, I'm assuming that's for staff. That's correct. Do you envision or do you think the department is going to look at doing a leadership program for the chairs of the various board under your jurisdictions? Yeah, I believe uh, the executive boot camp trainings uh, is part of that vision and being able to offer board members a list of trainings that may be related to uh, topics that may be of importance to board members or the board in general. Uh, as always, the department is open to feedback, so if there are particular course topics that you think we should be uh, adding to the portfolio, uh, we'd be more than happy to communicate that to the solid team and explore uh, various additional training options for board members. Also, you mentioned the June 25th uh, director's conference call uh, with the board leadership. Just to be clear, that's for the board's chair and vice chair. It is not for the any board members that uh, wish to uh, participate or partake in that call. That's correct. The call will be geared towards uh, board chairs and vice chairs. And I made a note about quarterly meetings with the EOs, correct? That's right. Uh, the department Just, is hosting quarterly meetings uh, with the director and board. Correct. Does that include, in those meetings, that that includes the board's chairs or vice chairs, or is that just exclusive to EOs? Yeah, that, those meetings are geared towards uh, board uh, chiefs uh, and uh, bureau chiefs and uh, board executive officers. Uh, and that's part of why we are now hosting this teleconference call with the directors. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> <clears throat> Let's move on to agenda item number eight, approval of the February 22nd, 2018 board meeting minutes. Is there a motion to approve the minutes? Prior to the motion, Madam Chair, I have some questions or some uh, correct, I guess, corrections. Would we do that during the discussion or do we, I guess we can do it now. Go ahead. I, I'm not sure. Whatever is the protocol. Yeah, okay. So the first question is uh, more or less, a, I guess, not necessarily as a curiosity, but also uh, for the record, uh, one of the board member was absent, and it's not noted whether he was absent because he was excused or because otherwise, and I'm just not sure that I'm referring to Dr. Rosa. And then on the roll call it says all members were present, but technically we had a board member not present. So all board members were present at that meeting. He wasn't a board member. Okay, at, so that's at that meeting. I was not aware of that. Okay, thank you. On page uh, 
on page four of the minutes, second paragraph, uh, my recollection is that Mr. Rufino suggested that the board should not require, but should ask, encourage individuals to provide an election statement about their candidacy. That is the, my recollection. So I did not, <clears throat> I'd like to, uh, to delete the word require and add uh, what I just, and then delete demonstrating their capacity to serve in the desired position that D. I'm sorry, Mr. Rufino. Um, I, I think since we're getting into specifics of the changes to the minutes, we should do a motion first sure. and, um, and then open the discussion. So I'll make a motion to approve the minutes. I'll second. Okay. Discussion, Mr. Rufino. Should I continue? Yes, please. Okay. Yes, go ahead. So All right. what page are you on? <laughs> sorry. Uh, <clears throat> So I'm not sure if we capture that first comment on the third paragraph. I think the second part that you're asking about demonstrating their capacity, you should repeat that. Delete it, yeah. So you should read, Ms. Rafino suggested that the board should ask, in, dash, encourage individuals to provide an election statement about their candidacy. That is what I uh, said on February 22nd, 2018. On the fourth paragraph, it says, Mr. Rufino expressed disappointment that he was not reelected as vice chair. That is incorrect. Mr. Rufino expressed disappointment with the board election process prior to election day, January 31st, 2018. That is more accurate, depicts what I said. The, the last sentence, he believes his effort were not appreciated and was disrespected, period. <clears throat> Page six. So I wonder if I should read, so Mr. Rafino expressed disappointment that the chair didn't ask the other board members no, that's not what I said. Scratch the other board members. Mr. Rufino expressed disappointment that the chair didn't ask him about his interest in remaining vice chair or becoming board secretary. <clears throat> now we're going on page seven and we're going to one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, ninth paragraph. On the ninth paragraph, the very last, not full sentence, but the very last, uh, uh, I'll read it for the purpose so that it, be it becomes clear to everyone. The recent board lecture will discuss ways to ensure that every board members understand the election process and agrees with the outcome. Scratch agrees with the outcome. No one will necessarily have to agree with the outcome, but it's to ensure that every board members understand the election process, period. And those are my amendments. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. I just have one small, <clears throat> excuse me, I have one small substantive uh, amendment here. I know we had a long discussion here, so I understand it may have been challenging to transcribe all this stuff accurately. Page four, um, paragraph seven states, he explained that prior to the election, he was under the impression that the board was maintaining the status quo regarding the election of officers. That's sentence one. Sentence two reads, he shared that he was very disappointed to learn that no other board members wanted to assume his current position as secretary. That would, is incorrect. It should more accurately state um, <clears throat> previously expressed interest to assume his current position as secretary. So no other board member had previously expressed interest to want to assume the position. And that's all I have. 
on page 11. I don't know if it makes a difference, but when it's talking at the very bottom under public comment, when it's talking about Dr. Egan, you know, on page 11 under public comment, when it's talking about Dr. Egan as dean of LACC, I don't know if you want to change it to SCU. Yeah. Uh, I, I think um, technically it, the college, because the the His university is LACC. SCU, but LACC okay. is a, he's a, he's the is dean a college just within. the chiropractic okay. portion. Okay. Doc, Dr. McLean left me with some notes about just uh, grammatical changes. Would you like me to go through those if or forward them to you? If they're not substantive, uh, those can be incorporated uh, in the motion uh, to approve the minutes as uh, verbally amended. Uh, let me just look at one to see if it's substantive. Okay. Yeah, looks like most of them are typos, and I can forward those. Any public comments? I have one oh. last thing. I'm sorry. Page five, first paragraph. Dr. Razzino expressed his satisfaction with last year's Sunset Review meeting. He stated that the majority of the board members, including himself, were not given the opportunity to attend the meeting. He should actually say the opportunity to participate in the meeting, speaker participate, not attend, because obviously weren't prohibited from sitting in the audience. Any public comment? I'll call for the vote. Uh, point of order before we call for the vote, Madam Chair. I just wanted to understand, be clear on what the motion is, if that includes the um, correction. Yes, thank you. Okay. The motion is to approve the minutes with the corrections. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes. You want the vote? Yes, please. Okay. Dr. Dane? Yes. Dr. Lickman? Yes. Dr. Aslino? Yes. And Ms. Rufino? Yes. Thank you. I'll move on to agenda item number nine, executive officer's report. Good afternoon. Uh, so for the... Um, Executive officers report um, the board members under tab nine. You have um, tabs A, B, C, D, um, and there. But the um, the handouts that are um, in they're, in the, they're not tabbed for the for the public. But there's um, there's handouts that go along with my report. Um, so the the first um, item is administration, and um, we we have two. Uh, vacant positions currently. Um, one of them, the staff services analyst um, position, which was which is the um, continuing education coordinator. Uh, previously, uh, Jeannie Mitsuhara was in that position. Um, we've offered the position to somebody, and um, her name is Natalie Boyer, and she's starting um, on the 18th of this month. So we're looking forward to her coming on board. Um, she, we're very impressed with her, and um, I think she'll um, be a big asset to the board um, and CE in particular. I, I think we'll, everybody will, um, it'll be positive, you know, we'll um, facilitate the CE process and, um, and start, um, we, we're going to start looking for innovative and streamlined ways of um, organizing CE, so I'm looking forward to working with her. Excuse me. Um, the other position is the um, uh, Marcus's former position, the associate governmental program analyst, which is our policy uh, analyst position. Uh, we've um, started the recruitment process. We've uh, it's been advertised, and we've received applications. Our next step is the interviews. Uh, we have to screen the applicants and uh, conduct interviews. So I anticipate announcing uh, a new hire in that position at the next board meeting. Uh, 
And um, I just, um, it, and speaking of Marcus, I, I just wanted to, uh, Chris Castrillo mentioned it at the last meeting, and um, and Patrick just um, brought up the future leadership development. And I, I just wanted to say that Marcus was um, one of the individuals in the first group of the future leadership development, and he um, he participated in that, and um, and so uh, he's uh, he's learned a lot through that process, and um, he's it is a I, I'm supportive of the process. In fact, I'm on the uh, on the steering committee, so for that, and actively participate and um, help mentor the participants in that. And so I just want to congratulate Marcus, um, not only on his still fairly recent appointment to um, assistant EO, but um, completing that process. He's, um, he has a wealth of knowledge about the department, and that, um, that enhanced what he already knows. Uh, so on to budget. Um, we're fortunate today. Since Robert, we're, do you mind uh, oh, at sorry. this time, is it worth noting um, for the public that the governor's office has just recently appointed? A, a new board member. Um, yeah, I apologize. Um, that's um, we we did on Friday. I was notified, and a press release was sent out by the governor's office that um, they've appointed a new public member. Um, her name is Dr. Theon Gordon. She's from Los Angeles, and um, she was able to be here this morning because of the short notice from when she was appointed. Um, she had a, a prior commitment uh, this afternoon, so she wasn't able to stay the full day, but she was here this morning to for the training and was able to meet the other board members, and um, she's um, she's previously until recently served on the um, naturopathic medicine committee so she has familiarity with DCA and our programs and I think she'll be um, a tremendous asset to the board um, she's very dynamic and upbeat and I, I look forward to working with her so uh, on to budget we have um, since we're here at um, DCA headquarters we're fortunate to have uh, DCA's budget office representatives here with us today so I'd like to ask them to come up and um, under tab B we have our um, fund condition and this is um, this is projecting um, we have two here we have our um, typical the fund condition that we normally have and then we have projections um, through 23 24 and this is assuming our um, this is assuming our increased fees, which um, will be in, when we get to legislation. We'll be talking about um, the fee bill, but as we all know, we recently did a fee audit and identified fees that need to be increased. And so we're we're projecting, assuming that um, those fees are in place on January one, um, what our fund will look like. So, um, thank you. Um, so. Good afternoon, everyone. Is the mic on? Uh, it sounds like it is. Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. Board Chair, Executive Officer, Board Members, Legal Counsel. My name is Mark Ito. I'm your Budget Officer from the Department of Consumer Affairs. Um, I'm here to present your fund condition and kind of go over it. But, but before I do that, I'm going to give you just a high-level overview of the budget process. All DCA programs participate in, in, in incremental budgeting, which means uh, the starting base of each year's budget is the prior year's Budget Act, which was approved by the Governor. And, the, and then from there, we make various budget adjustments through budget change proposals, executive orders, or bu budget letters. And um, we make incremental changes once those are approved and, uh, and processed. And uh, with that said, your current year budget is $4.217 million, which is the number that is included in, in the governor's budget for this fiscal year. Um, so that's a high level of the, um, of the budget process. Um, another update that I can kind of go over prior to the fund condition is we're starting to receive fiscal reports, the expenditure reports from the new fiscal uh, system. It was kind of a, uh, a rough go early getting those reports to come out, but we're caught up at this point. We have month 10 coming out of this here. Uh, and we can also do projections based on an extract from the system. So the fiscal system is transacting, it is working, and, and we have reports that come out and we actually have an extract we, we can pull uh, low-level detail of the system and what's been transacted so we can provide accurate projections for, uh, for your board. Now on to the fund condition here. Um, the fund condition that is included in, in your governor in the governor's budget for this year does not include your fee increase that is effective January 1st, 2019. 
Um, so your fund condition in the governor's budget that you'll see um, is the one that shows that your months in reserve and your fund balance are decreasing at a uh, pretty fast pace, it looks like on there. So you are structurally imbalanced, which means that you're, uh, you're spending more than you're bringing in. Um, so that's your first uh, fund condition in your, in your packet that you have. And your second uh, fund condition that Mr. Puglio referenced here uh, is the one that includes your fee increase. So if you're to look at the second fund condition, your spending and your revenue are pretty on par. Um, and you can kind of tell, you know, your months in reserve are slowly going down, even with the fee increase on your fund condition. Um, one thing to kind of mention uh, on the fund condition is that it assumes that you're only going to bring in the revenue that you project and that you're going to fully expend your appropriation, which is your budget for every year. One thing of note for the chiropractic board here um, is that you guys usually save somewhere between three to five hundred thousand dollars every year. So you're not gonna you're not fully expending your budget. So this fund condition assumes that you are. So although um, this fund condition after the fee increase shows that your your uh, fund balance is going down in actuality in real life with, with if you include those savings that you've historically s saved every year, your fund looks good after after the fee increase. Um, so I think that's it for the fund condition. I can uh, I can answer any other questions you have at this point. I have I have a couple of questions. Yeah. Um, well, and and just overall concerns that aren't different than concerns we've had before, but mm -hmm. um, our pro rata portion went up nearly fifty thousand okay. dollars, and um, although this board does try to spend less than the money that's fully given to us in the budget. Okay. Um, the pro rata is something we don't have a lot of control over and it's concerning that it can jump by tens of thousands of dollars um, a year without any end in sight. So that that's a concern for our board and, and one reason why we do try to be fiscally responsible so that we can absorb some of those things. Um, just being from the budget office, it, that pro rata has always been a concern of ours and it's a little bit stressful. Yeah, absolutely. What I can do is I can uh, provide the executive officer with some, with the methodologies and how we come up with the uh, parada numbers. Um, most of the parada is done off, off off a position ratio, and we do use workload when it is available. Yeah. Um, I do understand your concern. Um, I can provide the executive officer with information, and uh, we can have ongoing discussion. Yeah, and we've discussed that. it in previous board meetings. It's just mm -hmm. one thing that's a little bit of an unknown and. Um, we never know what the next numbers, the year's numbers are going to be. So uh, just, it's a little scary. Just to um, take Mark off the spot, no, it's, no, it's uh, you know, the budget office monitors the I budgets, but they have no control yep. over pro rata. So I, it's, I know. I just, <laughs> just feel it's important to <laughs> yeah. express our, you know, frustration with the pro rata sometimes. I'm not trying to put you on the spot. I'm just, you're here. We're talking yeah. about budget. So I'm going to bring it up in a public setting. Um, and then on the, Fund condition here. Mm -hmm. um, does this include our repayment? So, not, so this is you know we're showing a slow dwindling even with our fee increase, and and it isn't including the the repayment. Yeah, this does not include the okay. repayment. However, as I mentioned, with with your historical savings of three to five how three to five hundred thousand dollars every year. Right. I anticipate that, that your board will be able to start making those payments again. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, thank you, Mark. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks. Have a great day. Um, any public comment? Oh, I'm sorry. We're still on executive officer's report. Let me just turn it back over to you, Robert. Um, okay, thank <laughs> you. Yeah, um, so, yeah, and just uh, to um, you, to respond to some of the, the concerns, I mean, the budget is, is a moving target because there's so many things that we can't um, anticipate. Like, we don't know what DCA and statewide pro rata will be um, going forward, and um, that that can be 
that can fluctuate. We also, um, we're, we're still in the midst of preparing to migrate into a new database, um, and there'll be cost associated with that. Um, I'm hoping that the efficiencies we realize um, when we do um, go to a, a modern database will offset that. And But I, I think I'm very comfortable with, with our budget, especially knowing that we we traditionally revert money. We um, we uh, since I've been with the board, we've never gone over and um, historically have always um, uh, gone significantly. Uh, been I'm sorry, I'm losing my train of thought. Um, been significantly under budget. So it's um, I'm comfortable going forward that even though it shows that we're gradually dwindling, that we won't realize that and that will be. Um, pretty solid ground for the foreseeable future. Okay, so then on to um, tab C, which is um, licensing trends. And um, there's a handout um, called licensing trends for those of you in the audience. Um, so it, um, it shows um, the total license population, which is the most um, one, the significant thing we're interested in, which um, as of uh, April, or no, yeah, as of April of this year, um, we're at 13,099 um, licensees. That's um, we're uh, looking at just this year and in past years. Um, we're we're probably within the next year or so going to fall below. 13,000 total licensees. Uh, so, and, um, and then there's, there's other um, data on here, uh, number of licenses issued um, by month for this fiscal year, um, canceled license, and, and so on. Um, and so I don't know if anybody has any questions about um, any of the licensing trends, comments about this information. Uh, yes, you can come on up um, if you. Hi, Dr. Palmer oh. Pete. I just have a super quick question. Do sure. Do you know why there's a decline in licensees? There's a, it appears there's fewer people entering the profession. I've um, heard uh, you know from from the schools that enrollment at um, many of the chiropractic colleges in the United States is down, and um, you know there's there's probably a. a also an impact from the baby boomers that are retiring and leaving the profession, and there's just not as many entering the profession as there once was. So that, that combination of um, there's that generation that's retiring and just um, the, the volume of individuals entering the profession has reduced. And um, that's, um, and it, it, it's that way across the country. It's not just California. If it was only California, um, I would be particularly concerned because I'd be wondering what's, what's happening here that's um, driving people not to practice here. But um, we, we do have the largest chiropractic population in the country, um, and, um, but, but um, most other states are seeing the same trend where their, um, their license population is getting smaller. That answers my question. Thank okay, you. Okay, thank you. And Robert, to that point, um, I think it would be very helpful. We could obviously get this from FCLB to have once a year have a report of the general trend throughout the country. And, and furthermore, I think it would be worthwhile looking at other licensees in the healthcare specialties in California. Um, because unfortunately, I don't think the cases that medicine has seen a decline oh. and nursing is not seeing a decline, physical therapy is not seeing a decline. Uh, and the story goes, unfortunately, I think chiropractic is what's seeing the decline. And so I think it's uh, going to be very valuable for us as a profession to have a little better idea on um, looking at ourselves and looking inward and else, uh, outward to see what we may or may not be doing to attract more people. Okay. So if you could provide that, I think that would yeah, be very helpful. Um, yeah, at the next board meeting, we'll, um, we'll provide some data on um, the numbers throughout the country and also um, the... Uh, numbers of other healthcare, uh, or in particular, physical therapy, um, medical board, nursing board. There's um, osteopathic. Board. Uh, osteopathic. Uh, yes. So we'll, um, you know, we'll find out what um, their population growth or decline um, has been, you know, for the past few years. Thank you.
So uh, then finally we move to um, compliance or enforcement um, stats and we have um, we have the handout that um, we have at every meeting. Um, and so it, it carries us through uh, June 1st of this year. The, the far column on the right is year, fiscal year to date um, enforcement data. And then we have the four prior fiscal years. Um, so um, we're, we're getting close to the, the fiscal, very close, the fiscal year ends at the end of this month. Um, so um, as you can see in um, number of complaints received, um, we're a little fewer than, um, than last year, which is um, most likely a good thing. Um, we're you know, because this board has been very proactive about um, educating um, the profession and, uh, you know, getting information out, out about um, common violations and so on. So um, hopefully that's contributing to this uh, the fewer complaints received. Um, the, uh, and then it goes down, it, it lists all of the, how the cases were closed if, um, or the complaints were closed. Um, we, we issued 17 um, letters of admonishment and 17 citations and fines so far this year. Uh, and we filed 31 accusations. And then there's um, various other information if anybody has any questions about um, particular, a particular area or um, the numbers in general. Um, and then there's also uh, information in here for um, that gives detailed information about uh, the there's a, a spreadsheet uh, or a table that that has um, n accusations filed and it actually gives the name and a brief description of the violation that the person was uh, disciplined for. Uh, we also have that for licenses that were denied. Now, there were none um, this period. There's a disciplinary actions taken. Um, uh, reinstatements and and so on so uh, that gives detailed information for anybody who wants to know a little bit more about the um, what we're actually seeing in enforcement and um, we haven't had a we also will typically provide the um, uh, data from the um, from the department that the um, I'm sorry what do you call that um, yeah, the, uh, yeah, thank you. Um, the measures. Um, so, to, you know, where we we set our um, goals for um, timelines for closing um, complaints and processing and so on. And, you know, and then we, we measure how we're doing, and, you know, meeting those timelines. And um, we don't have any changes from the last one. Um, typically, we, you know, we're meeting or exceeding the expectation. Um, and so when we should have new data to report uh, from that on um, at the next meeting. And that's, yes, Mr. Rufino. Sorry, am I on? Yeah, quick question. Um, <clears throat> with regards to the fines for the citation, the amounts, are these amounts uh, the one that we already have received? Because I know some of them we cannot collect. Um, or are these just what do we have fined? Th that's that's the amounts we find. Um, yeah, we <coughs> they don't always pay when we when we um, issue a citation and fine, uh, but we do have uh, the ability to if they don't pay to submit the the matter to the franchise tax board and they can collect from um, from the individual's tax return. Um, we also have if it's a licensee, which most of the citations we issue, we do issue citations to unlicensed individuals uh, who are practicing, but if it's a licensee, um, if they have an outstanding um, debt to the board, they can't renew their license until they've paid that, so um, so we have that ability. So in most cases, we, we, uh, we are able to collect. And what does it show on the uh, line item on the budget, the, the fee collected or uncollected? Is there a specific line it's, item? It's probably not in the documents we have here, but yeah, we do we do get that um, we do get that information. Like you know the um, and I it, it, it's grouped in with other, so we wouldn't necessarily know it was a citation we collected, but it's um, there's a, there is a line item for for cost recovery. Okay, thank you. You mentioned, I'm sorry. Um, Mr. Pulio, that 
if individuals have a fine that's unpaid, they cannot apply for reinstatement of their license. Correct. They can apply, yeah, but the license won't be renewed um, until they've paid the total amount due. So we've had so many cases, so many individuals come before us that have paid their fees. Is, is there a reason why we cannot report them to the franchise tax board also? Oh, you're talking about um, for reinstatement petitioners? of license um, yeah. petitioners? So, so somebody who's been revoked, um, and we're, we're changing how we approach that because we're um, – they um, – Typically, they don't pay the cost recovery, and until or if they want to reinstate, and then then they'll pay the um, the board the money they owe for that enforcement matter. Um, in anticipation, as we know, some of them don't, and they still petition. Um, we going forward, we've um, and we've consulted with legal counsel. Um, we're going to um, not process an application. Um, where, where they haven't um, paid that. We're, we're starting to write it in the order um, to make it clear that they cannot petition or we won't process the application um, for somebody who still owes money. They have to have paid in full before they can petition for reinstatement. Wonderful. Any other questions? Any questions from the public? Thank you. That's all I have to report. Thank you. Let's move on to agenda item number 10, ratification of approved license applications. Is there a motion to? I so move. I'll second that. Any discussion? Any public comment? Call for the vote. Dane? Yes. Lickman? Yes. Azalino? Yes. Rubino? Yes. All right. Let's move on to item number 11, ratification of approved continuing education providers. I'll move to approve. The continuing, edu continuing education providers. I'll second the motion. So last we were on this topic, last board meeting, there was an application that was being changed, correct? That you, that you had a question on? No, no, no. I believe there was a, there was, the application process was being changed and. So the application process is part of the larger CE regulation? that we're trying to reform. Um, we discussed these continuation, continuing education providers in our last CE committee meeting, and it was the committee's recommendation to approve the CE providers based on the how the regulation is currently written. So the CE provider application and the larger CE regulation that we've been working on rewriting for a while now is all part of the same package. It's not a separate a separate item. Yeah. Does that answer your question or not? It does. And who is on that committee right now? Dr. McLean okay. and myself. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other discussion? Any public comment? So call for the vote. Dane? Yes. Lickman? Yes. Azalino? Yes. Rufino? Yes. Yes. Agenda item number 12, ratification of denied license applications in which the applicant did not request a hearing. There are none. So we'll move on to agenda item number 13, presentation by board's legal counsel on the Begley Keene Open Meeting Act and re-election of officers. Sure. I think so. That's Valerie.
Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board. I'm Ken Swenson, Senior Staff Counsel, Attorney 3, Counsel for the Board, and I'll be presenting on the topic of the bagley Keene Open Meeting Act. Uh, before we get started, um, because of the acronym that you uh, should have been exposed to in the board member orientation training program, we're revisiting that, and that's popcorn, which we'll go through the elements of during the presentation today, but to kind of get us in the mood and also to overcome any kind of late afternoon snackiness, we have some bags of popcorn available uh, throughout the uh, meeting room today. So um, sometimes um, it takes a little something to help trigger our memory. Different people trigger their mem memories uh, differently. Uh, it reminds me of, uh, I often look to Oscar Wilde for something pithy, uh, and he said that memory is the diary we all carry with us. And part of the um, memories I have on days like today is going to the movie theater where uh, it was dark and cold uh, on a hot day like today, eating popcorn and watching the movies. And um, so sometimes integrating those kinds of um, uh, memories of uh, past events can help us uh, with our recall. And the uh, idea here today is what is the purpose of the Open Meeting Act? If we can really concentrate on the public purpose of the Open Meeting Act, all of the other pieces of it fall together. So the P in popcorn stands for public. And under the Open Meeting Act, the public has certain rights. The Bagley Keene Open Meeting Act, which was codified uh, in California Government Codes sections 1120 through 11132 uh, was enacted uh, in 1967 uh, to require transparency and openness in government to promote accountability of state boards and commissions and to recognize and protect the rights of the public to participate in uh, democratic processes. The acts require certain uh, things of boards and commissions um, uh, that are part of the state uh, specifically to give the uh, public notice of the meetings, uh, to prepare and post agendas uh, for public board meetings, to accept public testimony and comment at board meetings, uh, to conduct board meetings in public unless specifically authorized to uh, meet in closed session, and to take steps during the meetings to protect uh, the access of the public to uh, participate in the meeting. When a board or commission uh, like the Board of Chiropractic Examiners uh, meets, uh, there's actually another participant here at the table with us. And it's part of our job as public um, officials or public servants to assure that the public has their seat at the table when we convene these meetings. And so uh, the purpose of the uh, Open Meeting Act is uh, to protect the, those public interests. And the act itself uh, declares uh, that the public policy of the state is that the state agencies created by the legislature exist to aid in the conduct of the people's business and proceedings of public agencies should be conducted openly so that the public may remain informed. So in enacting the open meeting law, the legislature found and declared that it was the intent of the law, the actions of state agencies uh, must be taken openly and the deliberations conducted openly. And the underlying theory for that really goes to our theory of government, that the people of the state don't yield their sovereignty uh, to the agencies uh, created by the uh, government that serve them. The people delegated authority uh, to the government and did not uh, give public service a right to decide what is good for them to know and not know about the operations of the government. So keeping these things in mind, uh, those are all the public purposes, or the P of popcorn, uh, in trying, uh, that one can uh, consider in trying to remember the uh, requirements of the open meeting law. Now, in order for uh, the public purpose to have meaning or uh, to actually uh, be implemented, it's important that the, the business of the board uh, and its committees be conducted in open sessions. Um, in fact, there's a presumption that all board business must be conducted in open 
session and less closed session is uh, specifically authorized under the act. Later on this afternoon, we have some instances where that will occur, where we're deliberating on administrative cases or getting briefed uh, by counsel on pending litigation. Those are two types of exceptions, especially uh, provided for in the open meeting law. So we have a uh, circumstance where um, that, that is specifically allowed. So the exception is narrow, but the general principle is that public meetings should be open for the public to, per, to observe and participate in. Um, there are specific provisions uh, uh, that are accepted. We talked about the uh, matters under the Administrative Procedure Act. We're hearing cases and deliberating on those. Uh, the deliberation part of that process uh, can be done in closed session. Uh, examinations, uh, preparation of test questions, uh, grading and improving or administering tests can be done uh, in closed session. Executive officer personnel matters that come before the board uh, can be uh, heard in closed session. Uh, but an item simply can't be placed into closed session because it's a controversial or embarrassing topic. So it's important to remember that in order to protect the public's right to, to observe and participate, the P, the process has to be open, the O. Turning next to P, for, uh, the next P is for penalties. What are the penalties for not complying with the open meeting law? Well, uh, as a practical matter, the most important penalty would be the remedy that uh, could uh, be available to uh, a, a person who challenged an action of the board uh, taken um, in derogation of the requirements of the open meeting law. In other words, if there's a violation of the open meeting law uh, and an action is taken at a meeting or by the board, uh, the decision or action could be invalidated because of an illegal process and uh, a court could overturn uh, the decision uh, in appropriate, appropriate circumstances. That could cost a lot of money and delay the implementation of important policy decisions by the board. So that's why it's important to keep in mind the public purpose of the open meeting law to avoid these sort of penalties. Also, uh, the viola willful violation of the open meeting law is a misdemeanor under California law, uh, and it, it could be uh, Pub, uh, punished uh, through a criminal prosecution. Uh, interestingly enough, um, that is a, um, a type of crime that's characterized uh, and classified along with things like obstruction of justice um, or uh, uh, d various breaches and defecations of fiduciary duty by government officials. So it's, a, it, it's classified as a fairly, uh, in, a, in a way that if someone was subjected to that sort of charge, it would be very damaging to their personal professional reputation, even though it is a misdemeanor, it is classified as an, a, a public offense against um, the government. So the penalties are something that could be completely avoided if uh, one keeps in mind the public purpose of the Open Meeting Act and the, the requirement that the, uh, that the uh, public be allowed to participate, that the meetings be open. Okay, the next uh, letter in our uh, popcorn acronym is for communications. So uh, the decisions of, of, or the actions of the board have to be taken at board meetings. Okay, And so that's why we have uh, public meetings. That's why there are motions and regular order during the meetings. Um, uh, you know, obviously, here we're, we have a um, quorum of board members. It's a formally noticed meeting. Uh, but there can be other types of communications, um, which the C stands for, that could actually constitute a board meeting even though it was unintentional. So as an example, uh, let's say uh, a committee meeting, because there's only two members, and we'll get to that in a moment, but a committee meeting with only two members uh, isn't um, a meeting uh, uh, under the open meeting law. You don't have to have notice and, and uh, follow the formalities. But if after a two-member advisory committee meets, uh, there's a communication, let's say, with a third member about what happened, then you get into a situation where there are serial communications. And uh, long-standing case law, actually under the uh, Ralph Brown Act, which is the local government equivalent of the uh, Bagley-Keene Open Meeting Act, 
um, th that these sort of serial communications can result in a board meeting and um, subject the uh, board or its members to the kind of penalties we, penalties we talked about. So the idea is that uh, serial communications uh, between more than two board members about what happened at a committee meeting starts to become a meeting under the open meeting law and uh, the uh, requirements of the open meeting law would apply. Likewise, uh, uh, it has, there has to be avoidance of what they call um, hub and spoke or spoke and wheel communications where the communications go through an intermediary. So as an example, let's say um, there's a, um, a chairman of a committee and uh, he or she is getting communications from multiple board members about a decision of, uh, that the committee is considering. Uh, you get into a situation where uh, that person in the middle of those communications is involved in this sort of hub and spoke meeting uh, that could actually be a violation of the open meeting law. And uh, since 2016, there actually has been a subdivision of the um, particular code section that um, makes clear that um, if these kind of communications can be in person or by telephone or email. So you have to be very careful about uh, these sort of serial communications or hub and spoke communications because it could amount to a violation of the open meeting law. Now contacts or communications with a staff member of the um, a staff member or executive officer that's permitted if it's a one-on-one -on -one communication but a staff member or an executive officer can't be used as an intermediary to communicate with other board members in an effort to circumvent the open meeting law. Uh, the next O in popcorn is uh, for uh, people who are mathematically challenged. Uh, o is for 1 plus 2 equals 3. So you have to keep that in mind. We talked about the idea that uh, uh, and if you go to the next slide for O is for the 1 plus 2 equals 3. Um, the idea is that uh, committee meetings, uh, one, go back one more, there we go. Committee meetings are exempt from the requirements of notice and public participation because there are only two board members and the motions that they consider during the board uh, the, the committee meetings are recommendations to the full board. So they come before the board as recommendations. At that point, then there's public comment before the full board acts on it. So there's that opportunity for um, uh, open access to the deliberations and public comment. But when you start having it, um, uh, more than two board members at a meeting of a committee, then it becomes um, a state body for purposes of the Open Meeting Act. And so um, that could happen either by a third board member appearing and participating in a committee meeting or through this um, serial meeting issue we just discussed or the hub and spoke issue we just discussed. So um, you have to keep that in mind. If for some reason a board member appear, uh, appears at a committee meeting where he or she is not a member of the committee, um, they're more than welcome to do that, but they can't participate in any actions uh, during that committee meeting. Otherwise, it becomes uh, a possible violation of the Open Meeting Act. Um, generally speaking, um, any sort of uh, uh, committee meeting should be noticed uh, if this, there's going to be uh, more than two board members present. Council, if, if we have question, would you prefer to wait until the end? Yes, please. Okay. So we covered O for 1 plus 2 equals 3. In other words, when, it, when is it necessary uh, to characterize a, um, a meeting of board members as a meeting of a state body for purposes of compliance? R is the next um, letter. It stands for roadmap or the agenda. Um, the agenda is uh, something that needs to be posted in advance, and we'll discuss that in a moment but in, under notice. But 10 days in advance is the requirement, uh, absent some sort of uh, exigency or emergency. 
Um, the agendas are supposed to provide brief but specific descriptions of the matters to be considered and the business transacted, and also to provide uh, notice about what actions might be taken. Um, the idea is that the board should not discuss or take action on anything um, that comes up during a board meeting unless it's in the agenda. Um, you know, there's always the issue of whether a discussion that arises during a board meeting is germane to something that's on the agenda. When in doubt, action should not be taken, and it should be placed on a future agenda for discussion after an appropriate opportunity to publish that roadmap or agenda uh, to give the public notice and opportunity to participate. The final um, letter in our popcorn acronym is N for notice, and we touched on that just a moment ago. The idea is that um, notice of the meetings need to be posted and published 10 days in advance of the meeting, should set forth the time and location of the meeting, the contact person. Um, if there's going to be a teleconference, um, the locations for the teleconference where there's public access and um, any kind of location um, for a teleconference has to be accessible to the public and ADA compliant. So um, that's an overview. I know it went through it very briefly. There, uh, uh, there's a lot to cover in a short period of time. I'd be happy to take any questions about this uh, particular issue of uh, compliance with the Open Meeting Act. I have a quick quick clarification question. So I want to go back to your um, committee meetings or subcommittee meetings, if you will, where two members and you said if a third member who's not a member of the committee, if that member shows up, but he does not take an action and does not partake in the vote or in the recommendation, but can't make public statement or cannot. So at that point, it is assumed that that board member is influencing the decision. The Board member does not lose his or her status as a member of the public. And so that board member could attend a committee meeting of a committee he or she was not a member of, just like any other member of the public. So if, if a motion comes before the committee uh, after it's been um, made and seconded and there's a pending motion and it's time for public comment, a board member can make public comment during that time in a committee meeting, but the board member um, cannot actively participate uh, as a member of the committee uh, because um, the committee is limited to two. Otherwise, uh, formal compliance with the requirements of the Open Meeting Act would be required. And does the member need to obtain permission as from the chair or from the body as a whole, I suppose, or not necessarily, or is that? Well, the idea there is that just like when a member of the public attends the uh, board meetings, uh, they're asked to sign in, they're not required to sign in or identify themselves to attend or participate during public comment, but it's considered a courtesy. Likewise, it would uh, be considered a courtesy to um, perhaps note if a board member wanted to attend a committee meeting he or she was not a, a member of, to notify the executive officer of, of one's intention to attend. Uh, that will uh, help um, uh, make everyone aware that um, that, uh, that that could be happening and, and so there can be preparation by the person chairing the committee uh, to avoid um, a situation where there's unintentionally a, the creation of a, of a state body for purposes of compliance. In other words, it might be easy to forget because you, um, Members are used to dealing with each other as members, but the role that the member would be taking at a committee meeting that he or she is not a member of is purely that of what a pub member of the public would be uh, taking. Uh, but as a courtesy, it would be a good idea to notify the executive officer so that the, um, uh, the chair of that committee uh, would, would be aware. Um, uh, just like it's uh, uh, considered courteous for guests during the regular board meeting to identify themselves for purposes of making public comment, all those not required. I have a follow-up as well, <clears throat> another follow-up on that. So same scenario, and this one is a 
Is there a policy that exists or was there a policy from DCA that mandates or maybe not necessarily mandates but encourages their boards to adopt the rule of the two member committee versus a three member committee? Because we used to have a three member committee, then we uh, modified that committee composition and from three member subcommittee to a two member subcommittee. So the question is, was that is that an individual board decision, or is there a DCA uh, guideline with respect to committee composition numbers? Uh, there is no such guideline by DCA. It's up to the board. Uh, the um, practicality of having a two-person committee usually uh, outweighs other concerns because there's a lot more flexibility um, with the 10 day notice requirement of say a meeting time or date has to be changed and so forth. Uh, it just becomes a lot more convenient. Uh, the public is still able to participate in the process because it's the, the um, votes of a committee come before the full board as recommendations and there's an opportunity for public participation and comment at the time it comes before the full board. Uh, the idea is that um, uh, as a practical matter, most boards do adopt a um, structure where there's a two-member advisory committee, although that's not required. And there are some boards, even though they have two-member advisory committees for certain functions, um, they actually require uh, formal agendas and notice, even though there's only two members. And some, so some boards have done that by resolution, um, requiring certain committees to operate more formally than others. And so that's another uh, possibility. But um, the reason that most boards have two member committees is for that whole problem of one plus two equals three and it becomes um, uh, a public um, meeting for purposes of compliance with the open meeting law and there's a lot less flexibility and uh, with everyone's busy schedules and, and the, you know, potential for having to reschedule uh, something, um, uh, it, it, it does limit that flexibility somewhat. It just, I just wanted to um, add that yeah, with, with our board in particular, we only have seven members and with, with three committees and if you have three members on each committee and some of our members have very limited availability and so it was near impossible to schedule three person meetings um, and do it in, in, with the 10 day notice and stuff. So it's, uh, you know, for as uh, Mr. Swenson suggested, it's uh, for practical reasons, it makes sense to have a two member committee, but it's always up to the board and any board member can bring that up at a public board meeting if they want, if they prefer three member committees. Um, but we, uh, you know, this was discussed in the past and for logistical reasons, two member committees did make sense. And just in addition to that, oftentimes the two member committees um, are publicly noticed so that they can bring up things, vote on them, and present them to the full board. So it's ease of operation for two member committees to get things done, get the information together, publicly notice a committee meeting, and then be able to present information to the whole board. So. One question here, Ken, or more of a statement. I, I posed the exact same question to our previous council about a board member showing up uh, as a public member at a council meeting. I believe you may have been in on this conversation. And it, it was just suggested to not because it may appear to be undue influence and the matter is going to come before the board anyway. So uh, is that something that many other boards have encountered? Normally, the board members are so busy with their own committees that they don't do that? Yes, and we haven't we haven't had an instance that I've been on the board since 2012 where somebody's wanted to show up, but uh, I just wanted to get some clarification on that. Yeah, it's not it's not usual or customary, but it's not prohibited. So I wanted to make clear, though, that if a board member appears at a, or visits another committee they're not a member of, they're participating or should be participating only as a member of the public. Uh, and um, if there's something that crosses over more than one committee's jurisdiction, then um, you know, the matter should be heard in each committee and then brought to the full board. 
I, I think to, to Dr. Azalina's point, um, I think it's um, the perception issue is is big. If you if you have three members in the room, even if one of them is just sitting back there, um, the members of the public may not know, and they see um, these three members. Also, there there is the possibility that the member in the back of the room could be making faces or body language could be indicating an opinion to the other members. So, uh, you know, it's probably um, better for you know for perception purposes if um, we don't have more than two members um, of a committee in, in a room but um, you know but I have been uh, previously I have been at committee meetings like when we had we used to have committee meetings the morning of the board meeting and so all the board members were there so sometimes board members would go sit in and listen um, while a committee was meeting one thing to keep in mind is that the committee meetings often are in a more informal setting where we don't have separation between the public and the board members that are on the committee and so if you have just enough if you're at a conference table and there's a board member sometimes it's more difficult to separate the idea that the board visiting board member is not in on the process and it can lead to the sort of uh, impressions that mr. Puglio was referring to so it's probably better not to it just simply it's not prohibited but it's probably a better practice or best practice not to attend other uh, committee meetings and of course with everyone's busy schedule um, uh, you know every it, it probably is not it's not going to happen that often unless it's a scenario where maybe there's a committee meeting ahead of a formal board meeting something like that so if there aren't any other questions oh. forgive me <laughs> one last question I, I just want to be clear you know especially since uh, uh, back to hub and spoke communication concept uh, I want to be very specific giving you an example in phone calls so board member calls board member a and he gets an agreement with board member a now uh, calls board member B and he's talking to board member B so now there's three even though they were not present it was done by phone at that moment once that happened is there a violation is that would that be a hub and spoke or or it depends on the nature or the, whether it's a policy doesn't matter at what what is your opinion as a legal opinion with respect to phone calls by individuals board member on the same subject with multiple board members I think that what happens is it crosses the line when there's an attempt to influence a policy decision by another board member so there can be communications of, say, a purely social nature. Hey, uh, when, we, when we're in San Diego for the board meeting, you want to grab dinner at your favorite place. Okay, that's purely social. But if there's a discussion about uh, some pending business before the board, an attempt to influence a policy decision, then it's beginning to um, uh, cross the line. Now, it, does, it, it, is a, it have to be looked at on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, but it's better, it's, in fact, it's a best practice to avoid um, those kind of communications altogether. So they can, it can happen in a very innocuous and informal, you know, unintentional way. Uh, if you're at dinner together with a couple of board members after a board meeting and something comes up. You have to remember if there's more than two other board members with you uh, and you're talking about board business, it's, it's a meeting. And so you have to refrain from talking about policy matters. Talk about football, basketball, um, talk about the Warriors, whatever you want to talk about, but avoid discussing uh, policy matters in those kind of informal settings. So social communications don't count, but what you have to avoid doing is uh, uh, lobbying or discussing or uh, trying to obtain commitment uh, on some sort of a policy uh, matter that's before the board. That could be of a purely procedural nature or substantive nature but just as long as it's starting to be, as long as you're discussing board business that's where it could be a, a concern and as a practical matter you know there are really few if any prosecutions for violation of the criminal pr prohibitions or there have been some particularly in other states like Michigan uh, there's a famous case there where eight members of a particular board got prosecuted and convicted of uh, misdemeanor violation of their open meeting law 
but there aren't any, at least any published cases in California that deal with that. But because that sort of a, even though it's a misdemeanor, it's classified as a type of public offense like obstruction of justice or defecation of a fiduciary uh, or public official, it's, it's serious and it's damaging to a person's personal and professional reputation and certainly would be something one would want to avoid. But as a practical matter, uh, there aren't really many uh, prosecutions for that, but um, it does um, entail the possibility of undoing actions that were taken if, if there was a challenge. And so the uh, important policy work of the uh, of the board itself would be undermined through that sort of communication. Um, and so therefore it's really important to do your best to try to remember popcorn during your um, participation. That is that the public has a right to um, participate and observe <coughs> Meetings have to be open. There are penalties for violation of it. Communications um, are the key thing you look at. If there's more than two board members communicating about a particular matter of uh, relevance to the business of the board, then it becomes a uh, public meeting for purposes of compliance. Uh, there has to be a roadmap or a posted agenda, and public notice has to be provided so the public has a meaningful opportunity to participate in the um, in, in the work of the board uh, to preserve that seat at the table, so to speak. So just try to remember popcorn when you're crunching on it later. Just try to keep that in mind. I, I appreciate that, Council, and I, I really appreciate it, but I'm still confused. So I'm going to, uh, I mean, we got it. I mean, there's no question about it. You know, you're in a meeting, you're in a restaurant, whatever. There's more than two members. There's three members. That's totally I got that. I'm, that's crystal clear to me. That the part that it's not crystal clear to me right now, and I'm and I'm sorry for asking again, is phone call communication. If I am not speaking directly, or if someone, I should not say that because I, I have not done it um, under the Brown Act, it was not permissible. And I'm assuming that the Brown Act is very similar to. But under the Brown Act, it was a little bit different. So I'm familiar serving in local jurisdiction, serving at the local level. You know, I'm a little bit more familiar with the Brown Act. I'm not as familiar. So, but that said, I just want to be clear in my mind anyway. I'm not sure. Maybe everyone else, it's clear in their mind. That if a board member has a communication verbal, not, in, you know, sitting down, not in, you know, social setting and, Regardless, if he's got a communication that deals with, quote unquote, policy, whatever the case may be, but it's a decision of the board, and he's having the same conversation with another board member, at that point, is that a violation or it's not? N not about, hey, by the way, let's eat at this restaurant. Not about happy birth. Oh, by the way, congratulations on this. We're talking about board business, if, I'm having, if, if, if you have it by phone. That's what I'm trying to understand. Well, I think the way to look at that scenario is once you start having those sort of serial communications, it becomes a meeting of a state body, whether you're intending to have it be a meeting of the state body or not. That triggers a requirement for compliance with the Open Meeting Act. So it's not to say that the individual communications are necessarily a violation, but uh, a series of those kinds of communications creates a scenario where it's required that you comply with the uh, notice uh, requirements. And um, so what ends up happening is uh, after, the, after that first communication, then uh, I'm not saying you necessarily have a violation in that sense, but, mm -hmm. but, you, but something has happened that creates the need for compliance. And if there isn't compliance, then whatever action results from those sort of communications could theoretically be undone. And I'm sorry, the, the attorney in Ken is trying to give a nuanced answer because the law is nuanced and there's there's very not. little black and white, but the answer is yes. Thank you. Uh, in my opinion. Yeah. If, you know, so so if, if you talk to Heather and you two decide something and then you talk to Sergio and say, hey, Heather and I decided that, or even if you don't mention that you talk to the other board meeting, but you say, hey, I think we should do this and he agrees, then um, in my opinion, yeah, you've crossed a line. But I'm going to hire Ken to explain, to save me. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's going to be the defense attorney. <laughs> the, the idea is that 
Thank you, Council. There's a difference between a violation and triggering a requirement. But once the requirement is triggered and you don't comply with it, then there's a violation. It's a cart, it's a cart before the horse kind of problem. But I think uh, Robert's, uh, Mr. Julio's uh, uh, succinct answer was, uh, was very <laughs> Thank you for your patience, Council. Appreciate it. Any other questions for Ken from board members? Any public comment? All right. Thank you very much. It's time for a scheduled 15 minute break. Oh, no? no? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We're still on agenda no, item but, number 13. But is it possible to do a comfort break, even if it's a five minutes? No, the agenda is set now. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Yeah, let, yeah, can we just do the 15 now? If you're going to take a break, we might as well do the 15. Here, sorry, Ken, to interrupt you.